Hi listeners, it's Kat here from Castagast. I just wanted to take a minute outside of the show to let you know about Alter Ego Empowerment Coaching. It's time to invest in your relationship with yourself. We all have a tendency to put other people or tasks first, but in doing so, we can sometimes neglect our relationship with ourselves. Let me be your advocate and show you a kinder, gentler way to treat the most important person in your life, yourself. Alter Ego Wellness offers life coaching to help you achieve the life you desire through interactive online coaching sessions. We also offer online yoga and meditation classes. If you think Alter Ego Wellness may help you, please feel free to contact me, Catherine, at alteregowellness at outlook.com or at Alter Ego Well on Instagram. Okay, now back to our show. Well, hi there, folks. My goodness, good to see you. Wow. Thank you for tuning in to another delightful episode of Castagast. I won't belabor you with chit chat. Let's just get right into it. Today, we have a very interesting story with some interesting attributes. We got learning disabilities, nine year olds, staring contests, and an exorcism. If you're thinking, by God, I'm starting to doubt the current trajectory of discipline in our school system. You're right. It's fucked. No, today we are talking about the devil made me do it case. This one's kind of fun. All right, I don't know how much fun it's going to be. I think it's going to be fun. Well, fuck you if you don't think it's fun. Let's just get into it. I'm John. And I'm Kat. And this is Castagast. Hi, everyone. Hey, folks. By God, here we go. Another one. We're here. Another one. And we're ready to party. Yep. How are you doing today, John? Well, it's Sunday. You used to always make fun of me for commenting on the weather. You always bring up the day of the week. No one cares. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's that's fair. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm a little bit um, hungover and tired from you, WrestleMania. Yes. I'm not hungover because I drank a ton of water between each drink. I uh, smart. I drank a big tumbler of fucking red wine and white wine. Yeah, because I lost a bet. Yes, we made bets on the results of WrestleMania. So that was for Seth freaking Rollins and yeah. Logan Paul. Yeah, you had to chug an entire full glass of wine. Yeah, because I thought Logan would win. All right. Are you going to give us a 17-minute disclaimer? Enough chit-chat, you know, yeah. talking about WrestleMania and stuff. We're not talking about real true crime, so we might as well just get right into it. Every result for WrestleMania thus far, you know, yeah, because we still have, um, as of this recording, we haven't seen night day two, two night, night two, two yet. Night two. So, but all the results went in my favor last night. Yeah. Good old Canadians, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. For WrestleZane, yeah. I was expecting more surprises. Like, the only surprise match we got was watching the Miz get the fuck beat out of him by whatever McAfee, whoever the fuck he is. The big surprise was the amazing performance we had from Lil Vert or whatever his name was. No, he sucked. The best performance, (laughs) or the best surprise was Snoop Dogg. Was Snoop Dogg. (laughs) Yeah. Snoop D O double G. Okay. So let's get to the disclaimer. Okay. Enough of this shit. Keep it All right. I will short. All right. I have to get coffee in my body. Turn on the fucking music. Hey folks. Mmm. We here at Castagast have a lighter touch to true crime. The lightest touch you could possibly fucking imagine. Or like that moment where you you're like, ooh, is that's a bit itchy. Ooh, that that throbs when I'm pooing and you just ever so delicately with with the pad of your index finger (laughs) slide your hand down your lower back brushing past your anal hair and creeping towards your hole and just just slightly dabbing 
the area around your rectum. <laughs> You're disgusting. To find the hemorrhoid of true crime. That's the, us. <laughs> the throbbing, red, irritated hemorrhoid of true crime on the asshole of podcasts. And you think to yourself, by God, I better get that lanced. And the reason we have to have this air of levity is because true crime sucks. It always has and always will. And we have to go to fucking work and make money. And we can't be riddled with depression and sadness all the goddamn day. So if you are not the kind of person who likes the ridiculing, belittling, and insulting of murderers and rapists and their shithole families who created them, and everyone else involved in these true crime stories who made it easier for the bastard criminals to do what they did, if you don't like that, you are a fool and a clown. And you don't belong in good society and you don't deserve to vote. For the rest of you, <laughs> that's true, for the rest of you, you're intellectual and cultured. And I hope you enjoy this lovely episode. So please sit back, relax, grab something that will make you feel happy during this time of sorrow. And uh, let's get right pissed as we get pissed off. Bless your hearts and good luck. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you. I almost got it down to a T. Yeah. I don't know what that means, a T, but... <laughs> All right, put, All right. let's get on with the goddamn show. You ready? Yeah. Okay. On February 16th, 1981, in a small Connecticut town called Brookfield, 19-year-old Arnie Cheyenne Johnson murdered his landlord, 40-year-old Alan Bono. 19 years old in 1981? My God, you knew when you started giving dates like this that I'd have to figure it out. <laughs> 1981 minus... 19. 19 equals 1962. You know what that means, folks. Boomer alert! <laughs> fuck these boomers, fuck these yuppies, and fuck everybody now that I think of it. Never gets old. It never gets no. old. And, and to hell with boomers. <laughs> Using a five-inch pocket knife, Arnie had stabbed Alan to death. What police thought would be a simple open and closed case would immediately take a bizarre turn and would eventually become the third film in a very successful horror movie franchise known as The Conjuring. Oh, I was, I was going to be like Fern Gully? <laughs> <laughs> when, Jumanji? <laughs> when Arnie was around. The Land Before Time. Right, I I'm said done. horror. Oh, I said horror. <laughs> horror. <laughs> When Arnie was arrested, he insisted that he did not have any memory of the crime and then revealed his motive behind the killing. He claimed that the devil had made him do it. Of course he did. Charged and going to trial, Arnie's attorney and the world's paranormal investigator power couple, Ed and Lorraine Warren... Oh yeah, Ed and Lorraine! ...would have to prove to a court of law that the murder was result of Arnie being possessed by the devil. How would you prove that? While giving his statement, Arnie claimed that these events started with his fiancée Debbie's little brother, David Glatzel. But how would you prove that the devil possessed you? Like, he left fingerprints. <laughs> it's his calling card. Like, I don't get it. According to Oxygen.com, in the summer of 1980, Debbie's brother David stated that he had seen an old man in their house. He was wearing a torn plaid shirt, blue jeans... And, quote, had very coarse, ruddy skin, end quote. Jeez, that's how the devil dresses. <laughs> David said that the man had told him to beware before he pushed him down on the master bedroom's waterbed. No one else in David's family or in the area had seen this man. But after that interaction, David started exhibiting some very odd behavior. He would display physical marks like scratches and bruises that came without any reason and experienced violent night terrors. David would wake with fear, crying about a man with black eyes, a thin face, and jagged teeth. He also had hooves and horns, and would haunt him in his dreams. Wow, that does sound a little bit devilish. After this lasted for 12 days, David Glatzel's family had contacted the only people they thought could help them, Ed and Lorraine Warren. Not the police... Not, not Why would a you psycho contact the police? Not the psychologist. Why would you contact the police? We're only going to... We, we, the heroes we need. <laughs> Ed and Lorraine Bobbitt. Not Bobbitt, you loser. <laughs> the Warrens stated that they were very disturbed by what they saw in David. The Catholic Church got involved and investigated, sending a total of six priests to examine David. They had performed... How young was David again? I think he was 11. 
That's why they sent six priests. They had performed three exorcisms. That was good. That was funny. <laughs> <laughs> when the pedophile joke hits you slow. <laughs> they had performed three exorcisms on David of a lower caliber. According to Lorraine Warren, the priests were also convinced that David was possessed. Lorraine also claims that during one of these exorcisms, David levitated. Oh, really? How high? There were also claims that during the exorcisms, David would contort his face and snarl, and that only the whites of his eyes would be visible. Jeez, it sounds like like an Undertaker promo. Judy Glatzel... Rest in peace. (laughs) Judy Glatzel, David's mother, confirmed that she saw plates levitate, chairs lift off the ground and fly across the room, and that one of David's toy dinosaurs would walk around on its own. (laughs) It's like Toy Story. (laughs) Plates levitated, but thank goodness the Tupperware stayed in place. (laughs) Lorraine Warren concluded that David had 43 demons possessing him. Just 43. Psychiatrists also examined David, and they claimed that he just had a learning disability. So So the special ed class is just full of possessed kids. So obviously there is some disagreement between the professionals. Yeah, a little bit of disagreement. A little bit of a disagreement. A little bit of disagreement. Just shut down. Forrest Gump was just possessed. Yeah. (laughs) Now you see here... This is the IQ of a of a normal child, and your boy is right here, <laughs> where the devil took him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, your mama really care about yeah, your education. That's gross. The devil may be inside you, but I was inside your mother. Now make sure you get a good education, boy. <laughs> Forrest Gump would have been a way better movie if. <laughs> It's a fucking possession story. In October, Arnie, David's soon-to-be brother-in-law, stepped in. He started threatening the demons to stop bothering David. (laughs) Even going as far as crying out, quote, Take me and leave my little buddy alone, end quote. He was serious. After taunting the demons and making this wish, Arnie now began experiencing some unexplained phenomenons. Damn. A few days later, while he was driving, an unseen force had taken hold of Arnie's car, whipping the steering wheel and driving him into a tree. Thankfully, Arnie was able to walk away unharmed. A short while after that, Arnie had gone to examine an old well that was located on the property he rented, and while at that well, he had claimed that he encountered a demon and held eye contact with him. He believes this to be the time that the demon took hold of him and possessed him. Never have a staring contest with a demon at a well. Debbie started to notice behavior changes in Arnie that were eerily similar to what her little brother had been going through. Oh. She became fearful that the same fate that took hold of her brother was now in her fiancé. She claimed that he would fall into trance-like states and he would growl at her and hallucinate but would never have any memory of this when he would snap back to himself. I think there's like porn sites with people who behave this way. Ew, disgusting. So the killing. On the 16th of February, Arnie had called in sick to work. He then accompanied his fiancée Debbie Glatzel, his sister Wanda, and Debbie's nine-year-old cousin to Alan Bono's dog kennel business, which is where the three girls worked. Debbie had stated that Alan had taken everyone to lunch at the local Brookfield bar. But during that lunch, Alan had begun to drink heavily, becoming intoxicated. They left the bar and returned back to the kennel, not having eaten much. Mm. So Debbie made a quick run to get the girls some pizza as the lunch was foiled from Alan's drinking. When they returned, Alan was very agitated and angry, and he then grabbed nine-year-old Mary and wouldn't let her go. Arnie had seen this and immediately intervened, and Mary fled the room. Arnie had grabbed Alan and was growling at him as if he was an animal. He then drew his pocket knife and stabbed Alan to death. Arnie left the scene and was found two miles away by police. That was a situation that escalated in in a very rapid way. With both parties. Yeah, like pizza? Yeah. (laughs) A day after he was arrested, Lorraine Warren informed the police that Arnie was possessed. Of course, a claim like this invited a media circus. Yeah, of course. The agents of Ed and Lorraine had promised book deals in a movie. 
Arnie Johnson's lawyer, Martin Manella, had received calls all over the world asking about the case that was now dubbed the Demon Murder Trial. The Demon Murder Trial. Martin met with two lawyers in England who had dealt with similar cases, as well as planned to have specialists in exorcisms testify. Martin was also ready to subpoena any of the priests that performed and observed the exorcisms on David Glasgow to testify at the defense. Martin Manella stated, quote, The courts have dealt with the existence of God, and now they'll be asked to deal with the existence of the demonic spirit, end quote. Okay. <laughs> I thought that I read that and I was like, I'm putting that in yeah, there. <laughs> I'm putting that demonic spirit. On October 28, 1981, Arnie Johnson's trial began and he entered a plea of not guilty by virtue of possession. Good for him. The judge who was assigned to the trial rejected this plea. Yeah. Stating it as irrelative and unscientific. And that the, quote, locating demons has not risen to this level of viability where it would be of assistance to the jury in the deciding case, end quote. So he's basically saying there's no proof to prove this you know well what kind of proof were they looking for like jesus well i would have been curious as a juror like as a juror to see what kind of evidence the defense would present wouldn't you Uh, well i would be interested exactly wouldn't you want to hear what the priests who were subpoenaed i just imagine like like the exorcist like they're talking about oh who who killed father damien karras well you know, she was possessed. Well, what evidence do you have? Well, you can see this green goo is actually like in a demonic ectoplasm. A lot of a lot of cases are decided based on eyewitness testimony. You're killing my joke. So I don't it would give be a fuck. it would be curious to see or to hear rather what proof they would have presented with the witnesses they would have brought to the stand. Just read the fucking thing. I rest my case. Okay. Arnie and his lawyer, Martin Manella, were forced to now change their plea to self-defense. And when I was writing this, it did make me wonder, maybe it wasn't in 1980s, it wasn't a thing then, but I was confused why they wouldn't change the, cl- the plea to insanity. Yeah. Because if you're claiming demonic possession, you think, why not just say, okay, he's... Well, in- we're going to rein that back and we're going to say it, that's insanity. That's, so that, unless just that wasn't a thing at that time either, I don't know. It's 1981. I feel like guilty by reason of insanity was a, was a plea. Maybe they were like, okay, there's no proof the devil's in you. Maybe they the, thought it, self-defense we, we, with Debbie's testimony with Alan grabbing nine-year-old Mary would be yeah. a better, more, mm. more prove, a more provable Maybe. plea. Anyways. It was the 80s. Because of the judge's rejection of the not guilty by virtue of possession plea, the jury would never hear anything about the demonic history of David or Arnie. They would never get to hear that because it was no longer permissible in court. Okay. On November 14th, after deliberating for three days, the jury found Arnie Cheyenne Johnson guilty of first-degree manslaughter. He was sentenced to 10 to 20 years, but due to being a pristine model inmate, he was released after five. That's a real big reduction. Holy mm-hmm. cow. Debbie Glasgow married Arnie while he was incarcerated, and David's family, as well as Debbie, still stand firm in their accounts that led up to Alan's murder. They believe, without a doubt, that both David and Arnie were possessed by demons. After the murder, David and Arnie no longer showed signs of being possessed. In 1986, in an interview with the Associated Press, Ed Warren said, quote, Possession doesn't last 24 hours a day. It comes quickly and it leaves quickly, end quote. Ed and Lorraine Warren both maintained their accounts in Brookfield as well, which led to a book deal from Lorraine called The Devil in Connecticut. In 2007, Carl Glatzkel, David and Debbie's brother, filed a lawsuit claiming that the book was a book of lies, and that the behaviors displayed by David was due to an undiagnosed schizophrenia diagnosis that the Warrens capitalized on. Mm. He believes they saw David as an opportunity and they took it. Lorraine responded saying the claims were upsetting and that she and her husband would never manipulate for profit. Yeah, like, fuck off. So that is the story of Arnie Cheyenne Johnson, who claimed that the devil made him do it. And this was the third film in the Conjuring franchise, which grossed $206 million worldwide. 
Yeah, but how was how was the ratings? Well, we watched it. I don't remember them very well. I do like Patrick Wilson as an actor. I love I love Pat. Okay, I guess you know him. <laughs> we are very close. Uh, it was a 55% on Rotten Tomatoes, but an 83% audience score. Yeah, well, that's that's the way all horror movies go. Yeah. The critics have to be such prudes. I mean, it's well, not the, nice. Well, Hereditary yeah. did very well. Yeah, you when you get like a little bit of an artsy one. And mm-hmm. Hereditary was kick-ass. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Conjury movies were pretty pretty good. Yeah, they were good, um, easy popcorn scare. Yeah. But I just thought that that would be an interesting case to cover. Yeah, you thought so. But let's see the viewership for our fucking podcast. You, the listenership. Oh, I don't give a damn. Why do you keep looking at my chin? Yeah, you got a little bit of hair coming out of your <laughs> Okay, mole. I have to post a photo of myself on Instagram mm-hmm. so people don't think I'm this hairy monster. I'm just going to cut this part out. I don't know. Uh, no, I will post on Instagram, you disgusting piece of shit. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> Marriage. Yeah. We're in it for the long haul. Hurrah. <laughs> what do you think of that story? That was good. Would you like to see pictures? Yes. Okay. That is 19-year-old Arnie Johnson. That's a 19-year-old? <laughs> he looks like he's 52. He looks with... like Gene Hackman. Yeah. <laughs> like... And there is Gene Hackman getting ready for his... Uh, prominent role in the french connection yeah <laughs> or to go coach a bunch of basketball players in the hoosers <laughs> yeah Jeez, he does look like gene hackman and obviously ed and uh, lorraine warren okay <laughs> black and white photos Lots it was to ni- say. yeah it was uh, considering it was 1981 yeah the photos were black and white i think they were just mm. news prints okay yeah don't have much to say about that <laughs> i just love the whole like He's possessed. He has a learning disability. (laughs) (laughs) That was the best part of the story. I don't I don't even feel any anger towards anyone in this story. I mean, regardless, obviously, Alan and I'm not victim blaming here. Murder is never the answer, but he was obviously very intoxicated and was overpowering the women and grabbing a nine year old. I'd be curious to know in what manner he was grabbing her too. Yeah. Like if it was in an aggressive manner or if it was in an aggressive sexual manner. Yeah. Yeah. Where it's what? like, you know, the solution to this is a few stabbings. Mm-hmm. But it is um, interesting to hear that he was growling and... He was growling at Alan? Yeah. He grabbed Alan and began s- snarling and growling at him. See, and that always freaks me out. Like when like a, oh, you see a wolf or a dog and they're growling at you and they have a knife. It's like... <sighs> God, you, you you worry, right? Like, and I never grab nine year olds. You know, when I in go- the presence of growling knife wielding dogs. I uh, never told you this. Okay. But one evening, one one night when yeah. we were sleeping, and I had gotten up in the middle of the night to use the washroom, I had come back and I found Bo standing over your sleeping body, wielding a chef's knife, and I said, "Bo, today is not the day." Your time will come, but it is not today. <laughs> for those of you who don't know, Bo is our dog and will be for the next maybe seven years and we're not gonna we're not gonna get a replacement. Bo has since gone into rehab. <laughs> he blames his parents and rightly so they were from Hamilton, Ontario and <laughs> <laughs> all right all right that's enough of that get fucking some story. coffee and video games enough yep yep wish me luck i'm finishing the terran campaign in starcraft one because i only play games from the 90s i guess i'm finishing the last of us as i would like to finish the game before i watch the show yeah so you can properly not enjoy the show yeah <laughs> and critique every change that they made just like I do when I watch a book turned movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Before we leave you to whatever you gotta do after listening to True Crime, Masturbate, Go to Work, we will have a, a nice quote from his savageness, Randall Savage. 10,000 years as intercontinental champion. Oh, yeah. All right, now. Put on your Randy Savage setting. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs>
Ooh, yeah. 10,000 years as Intercontinental Champion. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How does he do that? All right, everyone. What kind of quote is that? 10,000 years? How old is Randall Savage? Goodbye, everyone. Thanks for he tuning in. He can't be 10,000 years old. Get, uh, adios. He's not Ric Flair. Ciao. All right, bye. <laughs> You can check us out on YouTube at Catam Concoction. That's C A T A M C O N C O C T I O N. <laughs> and on Instagram at cast underscore aghast. Remember, there's a silent H. <laughs> <laughs>